How's it going, everybody? I'm Wade Lewis. Hi. I'm James Denton, and we're here for the No Valid Host Was Found, Troubleshooting Tracebacks and Other Common Failure Scenarios. So as Wade introduced himself already, I'm James Denton, uh, Principal Architect for the Rackspace Private Cloud Team. Um, Wade Lewis. I am a Rackspace Private Cloud Architect as well. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, we work in the uh, support team for the, for the product. What we're here to talk about is troubleshooting some common OpenStack issues. It includes tracebacks, uh, some common Nova issues, and common Neutron issues. Um, after the presentation, we will upload these slides to SlideShare at the link you see there. Um, we've got a lot of slides. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so we apologize if we talk a little quickly. Um, but we just want to make sure that we get through everything. And if we have some time, we'll do some Q&A. Great. So uh, I think we all know that OpenStack is a complex system. There's a lot of moving parts with limited visibility to problems via the API. The old adage of turning it off and turning it back on again doesn't really work here anymore. So you'll find yourself uh, in the weeds troubleshooting this stuff on the infrastructure nodes you know, when you have problems. So what is a traceback? If you're not familiar with OpenStack and you're coming from, say, a vSphere ESX environment, then you may not be too familiar with them. But if you run OpenStack, you've probably seen them before. Basically, um, a traceback or a, st a stack trace is logged or it's an output or a log of an exception that was captured during the execution of a program. Um, when it's caught, you can kind of go through and see the functions within the app that have triggered that exception, um, and that'll help you discern what may, the, you know, what may be the case with the, the issue or, or the error that you're receiving. Deciphering it sometimes, if you're new to this, can be a lot like reading the matrix. We've all seen that before. Um, but in this case, the traceback looks very similar to this. And if you don't ro rotate your logs or you're, you're not doing so, you might want to start now because it will fill up pretty quick. Um, the tips on reading a traceback, so you, you, know, you get this traceback and you're like, where do I start? Um, the easiest way is to start at the bottom. And you can see here, um, just in this example, MySQL wasn't available. So that's a great place to start. If you're not familiar, just go to the bottom, take a look at it, and see what you're working with. Yep, slides available again. We have slides available. OK, so let's move into to Nova. Um, <clears throat> no valid host was found. What the heck does that mean? A lot of times, that error is very ambiguous. So we need to kind of get to the bottom of that and see the, the reasons for this particular error and what the case may be. Um, likely reasons for this condition, uh, con condition occurring are that there really aren't any hosts available for whatever reason, networking issues on a compute node, um, lack of resources, disk, RAM, CPU, et cetera. Um, the good news is these days, um, I haven't actually deployed Liberty yet, but um, with Kilo, um, Juno, and Icehouse, the reporting's a lot better. So if you're on an older version of OpenStack, um, upgrading may help that situation a lot if you run into this particular error. It may be uh, more detailed. All right, so let's get to spin up an instance. You go to spin up an instance, and you're in an error state. The VM clearly has not failed to launch. But a few things we notice here, other than the error state, is that you are given a network uh, address. So you have an IP here. And that tells us at least that the Neutron API is functioning properly to get you one of those, an IP address, that is. So to get a little bit more information, you, know, you, you hop into Nova Show, and you see, well, there's a stack trace there. Um, but among the stack trace as well is we, we know that we have a libvert um, instance ID. That's good. And we know that we have a compute node here, as outlined in the red boxes. Um, so that being the case, if you know that it's been scheduled to a compute node, the easiest thing to do is to hop over the compute node and start taking a look at some of your Nova compute logs and your neutron agent logs. Um, and in this case, when we created this particular error, um, it logs another stack trace yet again in the uh, Nova compute log. And this time, we're getting a Nova exception, unexpected vif type equals binding failed. And so if you're a new operator, you're like, I don't, need, I don't know what this means. I've been doing Linux for quite a while, 15, 16 years now. And the first time I saw it, it was like, OK, not sure what this is. But basically, when Nova creates a virtual machine, uh, it's got to plug each of the virtual network interfaces into a virtual bridge. And the virtual network interface is known as a vif. OK, so that's kind of a, a prereq. You may need to know that. You can Google it. Usually, that info's out there. But Nova uses drivers that are specified in the Nova conf um, to configure that interface. Um, 
into the virtual bridge. And when Nova is unable to interface with the network agent and properly plug that port in, the VIF type is set to binding failed. And that's where you get that error. So now that we kind of know that it's a network issue, the next place to look would be your network logs. In this case, we're using the Linux bridge agent. So we're going to take a look there. And what do we find? Yet another stack trace. But this time, at the bottom of the stack trace, you see the error um, 19, no such device. So that's a little bit better. You know, we're, we're, as Linux administrators, or Unix administrators, that's not that uncommon to see across different apps and scenarios. But the problem is, we don't know what device it is. It, it could be any type of device. There are block devices, network devices, you name it. So what is the device? All right, now we're going to issue a bit of a warning. James and I are operators, and we like to you know, dabble in Python, but we're not. Neutron developers or uh, Neutron coding Python experts. Go so, easy on us. Yeah. So we go back to that traceback that we mentioned just a minute ago that shows a no such device error. And if you look at the traceback, you see a function called get interface Mac from the utils.py um, file itself. And get interface Mac seems pretty self explanatory. It's trying to get the Mac address of this interface, but we don't know what that interface is. So we dive into it a little bit, and you can see this code here. And it's pretty basic. OK, and you don't need to know a lot, but you know, we took a look at it and said, there's no error trapping here. Let's go ahead and throw that in and see what we get back. So we made a quick append to the file, saved it, threw a little bit of um, exception handling into this. It was literally three lines. And restarted the Linux bridge agent to see what it would log after that. Um, and by adding some exception handling, um, we can see now that it's complaining about interface EHT2. So we both looked at it and said, OK, well, that's dead simple. Someone fat fingered the interface ETH2. So the Linux bridge agent doesn't know what that device is. It can't do anything with it. And you get that error. So we go into the Linux bridge configuration file, and in this case, the ML2 configuration file. And we can see that there it is in the underlined section, EHT2. And that's obviously incorrect. So we'll make that change, restart the agent, and see what happens. And in this case, everything worked properly. But what do you do when you do a Nova show after you launched an instance, and there isn't a compute node there? There isn't um, a libvert instance ID, or maybe there is in this case. But you have a stack trace again, so that's good. But again, in this particular case, um, I'm not sure if it's, it's kind of hard to see from there. But it's a no valid host. You get a 500 return from the API and you don't know what it is, and now you don't have a compute node to actually go and look at. So you're kind of like, well, well, now what? Well, if the scheduler can't actually schedule the instance, um, then you probably should check the scheduler logs there, the conductor logs, and see what you've got. Um, and in this case, it's a pretty easy fix. Um, take a look at your agent, or your, um, excuse me, your services, and make sure that they're actually working. And the top pass there with the red box we see that, in this case, we have load balanced um, API nodes. And when it checked in, it passed. Everything is fine. It's labeled as up. It's working. But when we do another service list, specifically a Nova service list, to get an idea of what the service status looks like, we can see it's down. And we also know there's, there's a big difference in time. So right away, that's a problem. So what could cause that? Well, when agents check in, the database is updated with the time of that check-in. And other services, such as the scheduler, take that time and to determine if the service is available. Um, the scheduler determines the availability of a host by comparing the difference between its local time and its last seen time of the compute node. By default, that can exceed 60 seconds. And if it does, the service is marked as down. So in short, we've got NTP, NTP, NTP listed there. The time was off. The scheduler determined the device was down and didn't schedule a host, or excuse me, an instance to the host. So in this case, the Nova Compute Service actually was down. There wasn't anything more than just that particular scenario. So when in doubt, make sure across your node and all your nodes that the time is accurate with NTP or any other method. So let's move on to Neutron, and I'll let James explain some of the uh, scenarios we've got there. Great. Thanks, Wade. Yep. So Neutron itself is composed of a, you know, many different services and agents that are responsible for constructing and maintaining the virtual network. As you can see here, failures can occur at any of those points, either the DHCP agent, L2 agent, L3 agent, just to name a few. 
So let's start with the DHCP agent. Now, when instances are created, Nova will create a port through the Neutron API. And an IP that's assigned to a port, you know, that's a statically assigned IP based on the subnet that you've, you've specified. The DHCP agent itself is responsible for creating a network namespace and a DNS mask process inside that namespace that is responsible for providing DHCP services to the network. When, things, when the agent fails, um, it can result in failures to get, a, get an initial lease or a failure to renew a lease. Now, when you, when you create a, new, a subnet with Neutron, create a port, again, DHCP agent updates DNS mask with those network attributes. And it stores that file in a host file here at varlib neutron slash DHCP slash network UUID slash host. And that's a file that's past the DNS mask, so the DNS mask knows what IPs are eligible for leasing. Here we can see that uh, we have a MAC address that corresponds to a Neutron port, a host name of that particular instance, and the IP address. When an instance uh, sends out a, a, a lease request, DNS mask will hand out that lease and then update its active lease database in memory. By default, uh, DNS mask will store those messages in, or the, the DHCP cycle messages in varlog syslog or varlog messages depending on your distribution. Here we can see that we see uh, the DHCP discover from the client, the DHCP offer, which is the server presenting an IP address for use. The client will turn around and send a DHCP request and then the server will acknowledge that request. If you have issues obtaining an IP, start with packet captures on a couple of different devices. So you want to start on the tap device of the interface, uh, I'm sorry, the tap interface of the compute node, tap interface of the instance on the compute node to verify that the instance is actually sending DHCP discover messages. Then you can work your way down to the bridge interface on that respective node and then the physical interface. And you'll turn around and run the same type of captures on the network node with the DHCP agent to verify that the messages are actually making it through the physical and the virtual network uh, stack. When you run a DHCP dump, or a TCP dump, you want to make sure you're listening on UDP port 6768. You should see the, the full DHCP cycle of the four messages. Uh, unless you're running overlay network types, that those packets may be encapsulated in a VXLAN or GRE header. So here we have a working example, right? In the first uh, screenshot on the top, I'm performing a, DCB, a TCB dump on the tap interface of an instance, and I can see the full DHCP cycle there. In a non-working example, running the same packet capture, I'm only seeing my instance sending out uh, DHCP discover messages that go unanswered. And in this case, I had actually moved an interface out of the bridge to force a failure. Not a likely scenario in production, but it does show that if there is an, ag uh, an agent issue and it wasn't able to connect an interface, this is the type of output that you might see when you perform a packet capture. Great, so now that we're, we're all uh, good with DHCP, let's talk about a live bug that's, uh, that could be affecting a lot of you without realizing. So let's say you spun up an instance, it's, you know, no error, you, you realize that the instance is not available, uh, chances are that DHCP is not working and you're, you're troubleshooting. So we ran a packet capture on the interface and we see that the actual DHCP discover or the DHCP renewal is making it to the agent, um, but the agent is sending a DHCP NAC packet. What this likely means is that the DHCP agent was restarted and the active lease uh, database was deleted. So whenever an instance receives a DHCP NAC, it drops its IP off its interface and restarts the entire DHCP lifecycle again, which will likely result in a, a brief you know, momentary downtime while that happens. This, this issue was addressed in a patch. However, um, there are some effects there when you're running multiple DHCP agents um, that this patch you know, causes some issues with. So the, the patch um, enables a flag for DNS mask that says uh, DHCP authoritative. It expects one DHCP agent in the network. And when you have more than one, what happens is when a, an instance goes to renew its lease, sends the DHCP renew, uh, I'm sorry, uh, DHCP request packet to broadcast. All the DHCP agents are gonna see that packet. The one that originally provided the lease will, uh, will go ahead and renew the lease, and the others will reject it. So what ends up happening 
Same thing. Instance drops at I its IP and it starts the whole process over again. So right now there's a patch in Liberty that should be backported at some point where Neutron will pre-populate the least database when the DHCP is, uh, agent is started. So just like the host file, where the agent pre-populates the host file so that the, uh, the agent knows what IPs and Macs are available for leases, it does the same thing with the lease database so that you never have to worry about uh, you know, that getting dropped out of memory. All right, so let's talk about some L2 agent issues. The L2 agent was responsible for programming the virtual switching infrastructure and also uh, applying security group rules to, uh, to neutron ports. A failure of the L2 agent can result in a lack of instance connectivity, security group issues, and an immediate error state during a Nova boot. So when you're troubleshooting some L2 connectivity issues, um, here we have an example of an OVS environment where we have one compute node, one network node, and there's some interfaces there with stars on them. Those are where you're going to want to run your packet captures to make sure that the, the traffic is actually making it through. So we see we, we traverse TAP interfaces, QBR bridges, some VF pairs, integration bridge, so forth, physical switching infrastructure, and then back up through the network node. <coughs> One thing you want to make sure is that um, in an OBS environment, you have what's called the integration bridge, and all of your TAP interfaces for instances and some of your network agents, they're going to plug into the single bridge. Um, when you have different networks, each network gets its own local VLAN ID, and that VLAN ID is specific to that node. You'll see here in the example that um, for a particular port here, has a VLAN tag of two. That VLAN tag of two corresponds to some real segmentation ID for a network that was created by a user. And then there are flow rules that exist on the bridge that are gonna translate that local VLAN to the physical VLAN or the, the overlay segmentation ID. If, you're, if you ever see a tag missing, um, you'll want to restart the OVS agent on that node because every port in the integration bridge should have a VLAN tag. If you ever see a tag that says 4095, 4095 is what they call a dead VLAN, and it's sort of an error condition for that, that particular port. So in this case, um, I had an instance that was, plug that was uh, on a compute node. It was in VLAN 2. It's just the one I just showed you in the last screen. I did a neutron port delete and I deleted that port out of the database. Immediately on the compute node, that port went into VLAN 4095. And you can kind of consider that a security mechanism. If that instance was still alive on the compute node, still plugged into its bridges, um, but now because I deleted the port, Neutron has automatically moved it out of that, that local VLAN into a dead VLAN so that there's no jeopardy of any sort of security issues. Some useful commands you'll want to run when you're troubleshooting or just administering OVS is the OVS VSCTL show command. It's going to give you a high level uh, view of the virtual bridges on that node. And it'll also show you the local VLANs particular to that, partic that node. You can run OVS OFCTL dump flows and the bridge name. It's going to actually show you the bridges on, or I'm sorry, the flow rules on that respective bridge that you've specified. And the flow rules are responsible for manipulating traffic and, and help determine how that traffic should be forwarded across the, the network. You'll often see that uh, that local VLAN ID, there will usually be a flow rule there that translates that local VLAN ID to the data link layer, the real VLAN, or um, forward it on to, say, the tunnel bridge where there's some rules there that, that translate it to the segmentation ID of the uh, overlay network. And lastly, we have OVS OFCTL show and the bridge name. That's going to give you a port level view of the bridge that you've specified. and shows you the port IDs known by Open vSwitch for every port that's plugged in. You'll also see these port IDs specified um, on, in the flow rules themselves. Great. So now we have uh, a Linux bridge environment, one network node, one compute node. Um, the interfaces with the stars on them are where you can run packet captures if you're experiencing some connectivity issues. Here we have our little dot moving through there. In a Linux bridge environment, you're going to have a bridge for every network. So rather than OVS having a bridge for, um, for that particular host, Linux bridge is going to have a bridge for every network that you create. In this example here, we have network A on top. That's a VXLAN network. 
Um, the bridge name it starts with BRQ, and then the ID that you see after that actually corresponds to, to the network ID, the Neutron network ID. Inside the bridge, we have a TAP interface that could correspond to you know, DHCP agent or a router or an instance. Then we have a VXLAN interface, VXLAN-48. The 48 corresponds to the segmentation ID of the VXLAN network. Network B, um, same thing, a, different, a completely different network uh, with ETH2.33, so that's ETH2 with VLAN 33, and two TAP interfaces that correspond to instances. Some useful commands when you're working with Linux Bridge. Uh, BRCTL show is going to show you a high-level view of the virtual bridges on that node. Bridge FDB show is going to show you the bridge forwarding database. So it's useful for knowing how a MAC address is, is accessed. You can, you can consider it uh, akin to, say, the CAM table on a, virtual s or a physical switch. And then IP, taber, I'm sorry, IP neighbor show will show you the ARP cache on that node. Great, so now he here we are again. VIF type binding failed. We saw this error in the Nova example that Wade uh, talked about. So you usually see this when you're booting an instance or attaching an interface. It's typically the result of a neutron misconfiguration or an agent issue. And it's not just limited to instance ports, as we'll show in the next slide. So I apologize, it's a little bit hard to see. Um, but here we have a DHCP agent, I'm sorry, a DHCP port and an L3 router port that are both in a binding failed status. And what happened here is that a tenant uh, created a network, they enabled DHCP on a subnet, and they attached that network to a router. And what they realized is that their instance was not able to get an IP, and when they assigned an IP manually inside the console, they were not able to hit the gateway. So taking a look at the L2 agent log on the network node hosting those two devices, we can see that there was an error in the log that says VXLANs enabled, a valid local IP must be provided. So in the ML2 configuration file, when you're configuring port, you know, interface mappings on the host, you'll also configure VXLAN information like the, uh, the VTEP address for that node. And when the Linux Bridge agent starts, it takes that IP and it tries to configure point-to-point uh, -point tunnels between the hosts. And when the IP is either wrong or it's not applied to an interface, you're going to see this error. <coughs> so what happens is that the it, Neutron itself is not able to interface with the agent to determine how to plug in the DHCP or the L3 ports, and you get a binding failed error. So correcting that problem, restarting the agent, is, should result in um, successful port bindings. Now, one of the problems we have here is what do we do about the existing ports? Right? So our tenant is still having issues. Um, and what you have to do to resolve this, and it's probably a bug and we should report it. Um, we're not there yet. But um, to fix a router port, what you would need to do is unschedule the tenant network from the router, or the L3 agent, reschedule the tenant network to the L3 agent, and that in turn is going to create a new port that should bind correctly. The DHCP port's a little bit different. When you unschedule the network from the DHCP agent, Neutron actually puts the port into a reserve status. And the reason it does this is if you were ever to unschedule your, D or your network from your agent and it were to delete the port like it used to, and let's just say that you uh, spun up you know, 1,000 instances and, and exceeded your, your subnet pool, now if you were to attach or, uh, schedule that network back to the agent, there would no longer be any IPs to assign to that DHCP server. So what you would have is an issue where you couldn't hand out, uh, hand out addresses. So you can delete the port here, reschedule the tenant network to the DHCP agent, and then create a new port. Oh, I should add that uh, it goes into reserve status when you uh, reschedule the network to the agent. It does not update the binding status, so it remains in a failed state, which is why we need to uh, delete the port here. So when you're troubleshooting the L2 agent, a couple things you want to do. Uh, make sure that the respective L2 agent on the host is configured properly and is actually running and not in a constant restart. Uh, upstart, and if there's a failure, we'll continue to restart the service. Um, you'll notice the PIDs are changing, so something to watch for. You want to make sure that Open vSwitch is running. Most of the time, if o OBS is not running on that host and you try to schedule an instance to, uh, to that host, you'll get an immediate failure, so that's something to look at there. And then the agent logs are stored in varlog neutron on that host. 
Here we can see uh, Neutron slash plugin Linux Bridge Agent dot log. All right, last but not least, the L3 agent. So the L3 agent is responsible for creating network namespaces on, uh, for each router that a tenant creates. That router, in turn, provides uh, routing services between tenant networks. And it also provides NAT services to an instance. When it fails, um, you'll find that you're not able to route traffic. And floating IPs themselves may be uh, inoperable. So inside the, the, uh, the router namespace uh, is running IP tables. And for every floating IP that gets created, there's some corresponding IP tables rules for that floating address. Sorry, it's hard to see, but here we have an a couple arrows that are pointing to IP tables rules specific to that floating address. There's a DNAT rule, uh, two DNAT rules, and a SNAT rule for that. All other traffic that isn't actually uh, handled by a floating IP is going to be automatically source NATed by the router. If you have issues with uh, floating IPs not operating properly, you can actually uh, go into the namespace, make sure those rules are there, and if you want to, you can, you can add some by hand just to verify that the, the, uh, the action will work properly. But as soon as you restart the L3 agent, uh, all of those rules will get, will get wiped. So when troubleshooting the L3 agent, you want to make sure that it's actually running again, uh, and you want to make sure that it's configured properly. Um, perform packet captures within the router namespace on the TAP interfaces inside the namespace to make sure that traffic that you're trying to reach is actually making it through the virtual switching infrastructure and to the namespace. And if your floating IPs aren't working properly, make sure that the IP tables rules that should exist for that floating IP are actually there. And uh, you can also check the log in far log neutron to see if there's any you know, stack traces being reported. A little more neutron here. A couple of things you want to be aware of when you're running overlay networks like VXLAN or GRE. Um, if you're running the default Ethernet MTU, which is typically 1500 on your physical switch ports, which in turn is uh, usually on the virtual switch ports as well, and you use an overlay like, like VXLAN, there's some headers that are added to, to each packet um, that can cause you to exceed the MTU and that traffic to be silently dropped. So normally this will manifest itself in issues connecting to instances via SSH. And when you enable verbose uh, logging there, you'll see that you, know, you may have the handshake, but in the middle, um, it just hangs. And what you can do is update your subnet to pass DHCP option 26, try dropping the MTU to about 1450, and then rebooting the instance. Um, more than likely, that's going to fix that. Um, if an alternative to lowering the MTU on your instance may be enabling jumbo frames, uh, on the VTEP interfaces of each host and your switch ports. And don't forget security groups, too. So I can tell you that um, we've, had a, we've troubleshot a lot of issues that turn around and end up being uh, the lack of a security group rule or a, a misconfigured security group rule. So if you find that the plumbing looks good and you're at your wit's end, you know, try creating a, a um, security group rule and applying it to the port where you can enable connectivity from, say, the, the router namespace or the DHCP agent namespace, uh, test connectivity with ICMP or something uh, non-impactful there. Some other things that you may only see at scale are race conditions um, caused by you know, a lot of services doing things in parallel. Uh, we used to see this a lot in Havana and Icehouse, uh, but you don't really see it as much in some of the newer releases. Um, there's a case where um, if you spin up, you know, say hundreds of instances um, that, you know, Neutron has to go through and set up DNS mask host files and do these things while Nova is simultaneously spinning up the instances, they're ready, sending DHCP requests. Nova hasn't, or Neutron hasn't caught up. You may come into a condition where your instances have time out or given up, and you have to reboot them. So, uh, some other problems you may have: some some default system parameters are too low. You may see this in uh, default ARP table sizes where the threshold starts at around 512 ARP entries on a host. If you have a lot of instances on a host, um, you'll find that there, you have some, some random or sporadic connectivity issues. You'll also see this when you're running uh, the L2 population driver with Linux Bridge. Um, what the L2 population driver does is that it pre-populates the forwarding table on, on a host with information about how to reach all of the MAC addresses so that you don't see 
um, a lot of broadcast packets on the overlay. Um, most notably on a network node, say the L3 agent or the or DHCP agent, um, a router that's connected to a couple of networks, a lot of instances, it has to know how to reach all of them. So you will quickly exceed that, that table. Um, and that's a sysctl parameter that you can change on a host. Um, also, if you don't have any disk space available on a node and that service is dependent on writing to a file before actually proceeding, you may prematurely kill a service by running out of disk space. So make sure you, you, uh, you keep an eye on that. And last but not least, you know, syslog is your friend. There's a lot of messages that aren't logged in a neutron log file um, that are logged in a, a syslog file. So if, you, if you're not finding anything, check your syslog and, and you know, think outside the box. Sometimes an error is, is somewhat nondescript, but it could be completely related. Thanks, James. Yeah. Um, last, we're going to close with some takeaways. Um, the neutron failures can be traced back mainly to configuration file issues. So have a good look there. Start with just a real basic config if you can, and that should get you back to a running point um, to help you troubleshoot false fails. Um, yeah, so <laughs> slide. Yeah. Uh, yeah, problem exists between the keyboard and chair a lot of times. Um, and if you can, you know, obviously you have to get familiar with KVM. The lower level workings of that would be nice. Um, those the libvirt XML files. Um, all of that type of stuff, open v switch, OBS, I mean, that in itself, just getting familiar with it would be very beneficial, especially when you see stuff like broadcast storms, that you know where to look. Uh, Linux bridging and IP tables most certainly are important points to uh, review if you have issues or you're running the Linux bridge agent. Um, also, familiar, familiarize yourself with the working environment if you can. If you have a dev environment that's working, you can use as a reference, that will pay huge dividends. <clears throat> Turn on debug mode. We haven't mentioned that. If you do, just keep an eye on your logs. They're going to they're fill up quick. Um, start services by hand. A lot of times you'll see errors that way that you don't see in the log. Um, reach out to the community and gather as much information as possible before submitting a bug. That way you don't waste your time when it gets rejected so that it, so that it doesn't get rejected. <laughs> um, and that's it. Don't be afraid to break stuff. Uh, James and I have a ton of experience doing that. So if you have any questions about breaking Neutron or Nova, we'll be available to talk. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah. Oh, sorry. well, uh, sorry, yeah, sorry, I just wanted I? to add to that a little bit, right? So when we say don't break, you know, don't be afraid to break things, obviously not production, right? Not production, um, yeah. But I, I'm a real big advocate of, of creating lab environments. Uh, VirtualBox is a great place to start if you don't have the resources. Um, get in there, you know, docs.openstack.org is great. They have a lot of different scenarios that'll help you uh, kind of sort of figure things out. Um, when you're breaking stuff, you know, spin up an instance, let it get connected to a bridge, make sure it works, then start pulling interfaces out of bridges and just see what the behavior is, right? Try and create failure scenarios so that you can sort of reverse engineer when you do have failures in production. You know, you know where to look. And then uh, lastly, so Rackspace, um, we're giving away some books here um, during the morning and afternoon breaks. In the morning, they're giving away the OpenStack Cloud Computing Cookbook, the latest third edition. In the afternoon, they're giving away Learning OpenStack Networking, um, the first edition. Um, and then coming soon, uh, at the next summit, we'll have the second edition of the same book. So in there, you know, you'll, you'll learn more or less, you'll get a good foundation on, on what Neutron should look like in a reference architecture with some troubleshooting. So stop by and grab a copy. And if you want the slides, uh, again, after this, uh, sometime this afternoon, we'll try and throw them up on SlideShare, but you know, Looks like we have some time, so we can be at the back of the room to answer any questions that you've got or do our best. Now, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you.